So this is a um, video of an ML simulation learning to walk. And also sort of a metaphor for me trying to deploy ML to production. <laughs> but um, so I'm going to introduce myself. This is a talk on CI CD for machine learning, which we also call ML Ops. If you like that um, name, you can stick with it. If you don't, you don't have to. Um, I am Sasha Rosenbaum. I work for Microsoft. I'm a program manager on the Azure DevOps team. Um, I used to be a developer for about eight years, and then I started deploying things into production. Um, and I liked it so much that I switched to that. Um, now that I introduced myself, um, tell me a little bit about you. So who here is a developer? OK, most of you. Cool. Um, anybody ops, DevOps, SRE something? OK, half of you too. OK, interesting. The titles merge. Anybody a data scientist? OK, I got a few. So I want to talk to you after this talk, and you tell me if this makes sense, and if you like it, and if it needs to be you know, better in any way. Um, I don't come from uh, a data scientist background, um, so this is mostly about me talking to Microsoft internal people and to our customers, trying to help people get from ML models into production. So I'm going to start with some definitions, because I like to level set. So what's ML ops, and why should you care? So ML machine learning, let's just define that for the beginning, um, is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. Right? So that simulation we saw in the beginning, that simulation is learning to walk while you know, attempting to do that. So there's no programmer that's writing an explicit if else statement, if I hit it with a box from this angle, um, you recover by doing x, y, and z. Right? It's actually just learning from the data. Um, this is something that um, a lot of people don't grasp. Like, if you look at the congressional hearings about like um, Facebook algorithms and stuff like that, a lot of people still don't uh, fully appreciate the fact that there's no explicit programming that goes into ML, and that's the main difference, right? Whether we call it AI, like artificial intelligence, whether we call it machine learning, deep learning, this is all about computers learning from data rather than being explicitly programmed. So this thing has been on the rise. So that's why you know, a lot of people are starting to venture into this. Um, I don't have a Forrester report that I can share, but um, I was just looking at uh, some Google search tags. So basically, the ML um, is overtaking DevOps. And also, if you look at programming languages, Python is overtaking pretty much everything else lately. Um, and Python is the language mostly used for machine learning, so um, we can kind of gather from this data that a lot of machine learning that's happening. Um, and that is actually also true if I talk to customers. Everybody's trying to get into this space, small companies, big companies, um, everybody in the world. So this is all well and nice, uh, but if you're not a data scientist, right, if you are a, a developer or DevOps, like, how is this relevant to you? Well, so. This is why. This is a tweet from somebody that um, says, OK, the story of enterprise machine learning, it took me three weeks to develop a model, and it's been 11 plus months, and it's still not deployed. Right? Because this is complicated, right? and people who are in data science mostly want a data science. Right? This is a whole job. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and they probably don't really want to work also on deploying their stuff into production. So somebody has to do it. Uh, but for that, we all need to kind of understand each other, right? Um, so just you know, to talk about data science some more, this is a you know, uh, training algorithm for deep learning. Some of this stuff gets really complex. You know, this is back propagation. I took a couple of classes on ML just to get some context. So it's a lot of heavy math and scary things. Um, and you know, it's it just like, if I'm a data scientist, I probably want to work out how to make this better um, and make my model make better predictions rather than deploy it. Um, and the typical data science work environment looks like this. So most people work in Jupyter notebooks, right? And again, if I talk to um, 
clients and Microsoft people, like most of them are at the stage where they have to um, checked their Jupyter notebooks or Python scripts or Scala scripts or whatever it is into Git. So this is cool. Like they learned the benefits of source control. This is awesome. Um, but we still need to make a lot of steps before we get into actual clients consuming our software. So let's talk about the differences between the programming and ML in terms of process. So in regular programming, we, we create an algorithm. Um, we give it data, and it produces answers. Right? So again, writing explicit algorithms. In machine learning, it kind of switches. So we give the um, model, we give it answers and data, right? So we give it labeled data, which means we have to have data sets, right? We feed it into this black box of training, right? And it produces the algorithm, which is also called a model. Um, and then once we deploy that model, we can feed it new data and it can produce predictions, right? So this is mostly what it is all about. Um, People are trying to predict the future. To predict the future, they need to learn from the past. Right? Um, so let's say that we've developed this model, and this is all well and great. Um, we climbed that Everest. We, we, gathered some, we created something from whatever process it was that can predict the future really well. Um, now, how do we get into production? So we just said that like some of these things, sorry, some of these things are ridiculously complex. Um, and so that's why when people talk about model, also model is kind of an abstract word. Um, so it can uh, denote many things. Um, so what really is a model? Well, if I talk to people out there, most of them are actually not doing like these super complicated things that involve deep learning and that like do stuff. They do stuff that you could, in theory, do with Excel, right? Um, most of you, if you had a technical degree of some sort, you learn about linear regression, right? So you gather data, and then you try to draw a line essentially through it and get, um, get the formula that will be like y equals a plus bx. Um, and then when you get the input a new x into this formula, you'll get a new y, right? So this one is a housing prices in a certain region um, as a function of year. So honestly, most people out there who are deploying ML models, this is what they're deploying. This is kind of like what we're talking about. Um, again, not true for everybody, but it's true for a lot of people. So essentially, we're saying that ML model is a definition of a mathematical formula with numbers with a number of par parameters that are learned from data. So this is good news because once I see that, I go like, okay, I, I know what I need to do. I need to create like an API endpoint, right, that will consume inputs, not necessarily a single one, maybe it's five, maybe it's an image, which is a whole lot of input if, if you consider that, um, or maybe it's, again, a single X, and it will output something. Maybe it's a prediction uh, of like what an image actually is, uh, maybe it's a number, maybe it's a set of numbers, but essentially this is what it is. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, so this is great, Right? Um, if I know what my model is and I know that all I need to do is create sort of a service with an API. The next question someone asked me like last week was like, do models really change that often? Like, do we really need to automate this process? Like maybe we just like, you know, data scientists go into this little room and they, you know, work on stuff for two months and then like maybe we deploy it like and and then it's stale for another year and that's fine. Um, that's essentially not true, like this is really far from true. So if you think, like the best example is for the models that you run across every day, <laughs> yeah, um, are recommendation models. So yeah, this one says, Facebook's list of suggested friends is quite literally a list of people I've been avoiding my entire life. I've also seen a version of this which says my ex-girlfriend slash boyfriends. <laughs> but, but the thing is, it used to be that way, but it's not that way anymore, right? The suggested friends has actually improved a lot. So does um, Yelp suggestions for restaurants I need to go to. So does Uber matching me with drivers, right? 
all these things are actually uh, ML predictions, right? Um, and all these companies actually deploy models every single day. So if you look at the big companies out there, such as us, so Microsoft or um, Facebook or um, Google, Uber, which are the particular ones on this slide, but um, these companies, to them, models are actually their livelihood and they actually deploy them multiple times a day potentially. So they have these whole systems built around this. The problem is that those systems are custom made, right? So most of this is not something that is a tooling that exists out there, it's a tooling that we built for ourselves. Um, actually, in, in terms of Microsoft, we're slowly just starting the process of kind of bringing it all together and being like, hey, we built a service to automate ML stuff and we you know, have ML stuff that's being pushed out for Outlook, for Bing, for all these things um, every day. Let's kind of bring it all together, right? Because one of the things that we did on the Azure DevOps team, for instance, was that we said we kind of ma mandated people to use our own tools um, because it allows us to learn from our own mistakes. Right? So we're slowly trying to do this for ML as well because Again, there's nothing like the person next door calling me and telling me, hey, you, your software has a bug. Um, I know I called one person in this room with your software has a bug like two weeks ago, so. Um, anyway, so basically the problem for most people is that they don't work for Microsoft or Google, right? Um, and they actually are trying to do this work without having lots of money and lots of engineers to put on projects. So basically, we want to learn to iterate. And for that, like, we want to bring the data scientist and the DevOps, or whatever it's called today, uh, person together. Right? So the truth is that these people have shared concerns. Not all of the concerns are shared, but some of them are. And both of them care about iterating quickly. Both of them care, at least to some extent, about re reliability. Both of them definitely care about repeatability. So what happens if I actually built a model um, and it was doing pretty well, but then something happened and I pushed a new one to production and it's doing worse. And now all my predictions are crap and I'm, I don't know, matching people with the wrong drivers or whatever it is. Um, so I want to be able to go back to the last known good version and redeploy that, right? That would save me a lot of grief. So repeatability, reusability, being able to label this stuff is really important. So the machine learning lifecycle approximately looks like this, and it's funny because like the, the boxes, some of these boxes are much bigger than others, so the train model is actually a huge box because there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Uh, but then you need to kind of package it, validate that it actually works, deploy it, and then monitor because models also drift, because the data changes or because like your input actually changes, your application changes, and you need to change the behavior. Um, so you actually can't, like even if your model is perfect today and it's super accurate, you can't rely on that being accurate forever. So what we can do is we can build sort of, if we don't work for a huge company, or even if we do, we can build this sort of homegrown system for automating this. So I'm gonna try not to fall off the stage. Um, so basically, in this demo, I'm gonna be using these tools, uh, but you can take, you know, obviously you need some type of source control because I don't think I need to sell anybody on the benefits of source control. Um, and then you need some sort of automation tool, right? So I'm, shocker, I'm using Azure DevOps because I work for Azure DevOps team. Uh, but you could do this with Jenkins or Go or Circle CI or whatever else is out there. Pretty much everybody has some type of automation tool. Um, and then the centerpiece is the training and packaging the model and deploying it. And I'm using both Kubeflow and Azure ML. Both of these tools are kind of new. Um, and they are capable of doing similar things. I could use just one of them. I'm using both for different pieces. Um, you could also get away with not using either of those tools. Your life would just be a lot harder if you did. So. One more flow diagram. Um, so if we talk about the code, this would be the developer checks in code, right? So in terms of the data scientists, we now talk about code, data set, and environment versioning. So there's 
more pieces that are going into this actually, right? Because my code actually matters, right? I wrote some type of algorithm that is doing something. Um, but I also, the data set really, really matters because if the data set changes, uh, my model might change significantly. So I need to be able to version that as well and save that somewhere. Um, one of the biggest problems with this actually is like <laughs> the storage for data sets um, and also being able to access data. Because like I gave this talk a couple weeks ago and people were asking me about like, well, why don't you talk about, I don't know, um, Azure monitoring solutions and display data from them. I'm like, okay, I would have to go for a year to, to actually be able to have non-PII data that I could use you know, that wasn't customer information that I could train my model on. So this is uh, part of the complication of the whole thing. Um, and then the metadata for the environment also matters. And then I go into building the app so I can go into training the model and I'm gonna go through this a little bit in more detail during the demo. Um, but again, not a data scientist, so it's kind of a little bit of magic to me. Um, and then basically I, we can talk about different things, so both of the tools that we discussed can do things like fanning out hyperparameters, which is really, really cool if you're a data scientist, because that means that I can try different things to train different models at the same time and then see which one's the best. Um, so that's really cool if I don't have to sort of do that sequentially, because it does take a long time. Um, then I test my applications, then I release them. Now, I think, I don't know if there's anybody out there who would actually rely on an automated process. I actually don't know a lot of people who rely on automated processes to deploy them software with like zero human intervention. Um, I definitely don't think we're mature enough to do this for ML, but even if you do have to manually validate it and have an actual human go through and see, hey, you know, my accuracy is better and this all looks sane and whatever before you deploy it, as long as this is a check that you can sort of click a button and push it into production, your life is a lot better. Um, and then again, you need to be able to monitor this whole thing um, and potentially go to model retraining. So there was a talk on Kubeflow here. I don't know if anybody had attended that. A couple of folks, okay. Um, I'm not gonna dive super into Kubeflow. Kubeflow is a open source project that is deployed on top of Kubernetes um, that can be used for ML, for automation of ML model lifecycle, um, which is great news if you like Kubernetes and not so great news if you don't know what Kubernetes is. Um, I wouldn't ask a data scientist to go deploy Kubeflow because it's painful and uh, it, it, it's not so complicated, but it's definitely probably not something they want to worry about. Um, but what it does allow, allow you to do, so it's built on containers, so every piece in here would be a container. Um, so you basically containerize different steps in your ML workflow, and you can use it as a template. So if I created this Kubeflow pipeline, now pipelines is a word that's used by everybody, and it means slightly different things to different people, but this is an ML pipeline. Um, so basically, if I created this workflow, I can then share it with other people who have similar problems, and they can start from this instead of starting from scratch in terms of what their workflow looks like. Um, and then Azure ML is a service that can basically train, test, deploy, manage ML models. It, again, if I did I could do this demo using only Kubeflow or using only Azure ML in terms of the training. Um, they're slightly different, they're slightly better at different things. To, to the extent that I can see, Azure ML appears to be more mature, but it is also not um, open source, so kind of choose your poison. Um, but Azure ML is a hosted service that allows you to um, automate similar things. Okay. I'm gonna go into the demo and pray to demo gods that it works. So this starts with, basically I have a repository. So everything that I'm showing today is in the GitHub repository and it's got a readme um, that you could try to follow and basically automate all of the steps and deploy the exact same thing. 
Um, so you could try it yourself. Um, what's in the repo is both the code for this stuff and um, all of the pipelines. So this first one is a pipeline for Kubeflow. So I'm just gonna check in a small change to like the readme so we can kick it off and see it actually run. Okay, so this is the repo. Um, it's gonna be in the resources slide in the end of the talk, but it's uh, github.com divine ops, which is my alias, and then kubeflow dash and dash ml ops. Um, and this readme is about you know two, two hours long just to read. Um, so you can guess how long it takes to deploy. <laughs> but basically it kind of highlights the entire process. So. I'm running on Azure, again, shocker. I work for Microsoft for Azure DevOps team, so I'm running on Azure. Um, but you could, if you had a Kubernetes cluster elsewhere, you could absolutely run Kubeflow there. Um, so there's no limitation on that. You could also run Azure DevOps. It's a SaaS service, and it's got a free tier um, if you're a small organization or an open source project. So you can always run Azure DevOps, um, basically try it free of charge. Um, the thing that is not free is uh, Azure ML, but it does automate some pieces of this workflow, which would be hard to do if you had to build them from scratch. But again, you can. Um, so basically, I'm running a Kubernetes cluster on which Kubeflow is deployed. Um, I have a Docker container registry to which I'm deploying the containers that are generated by the pipeline for the Kubeflow steps. Um, so. And then I have an Azure pipeline, so I'm gonna switch to the CI pipeline. Let's see if it kicked off. Or not. Okay, I'm gonna show you a run that already ran, so this is great. Actually, let me do something slightly different. Let's go into edit this. Oh yeah, that's great. Not good because I don't know that I can remember my password right here on stage, so this is good. The demo gods do not like me. All right, so basically what this does, actually, let me show you here. What this does is it's a YAML pipeline that runs on Azure pipelines, and it creates three containers. So the Docker files for this, and this is super dark. Can you guys see this? Okay, is that better? Okay, cool. So it's an Azure YAML pipeline. Um, it runs on a host of Ubuntu agents, um, and this is just creating a Docker container and pushing it into an Azure container registry. The Docker container is created based on the files that is that are in this repo. So there's a preprocess register and uh, preprocess train and register. Right, so it's three different containers. Uh, basically, the preprocess, for instance, will um, pick up the data set, download it to the local attached volume, um, and make sure that it's all there. Then train is gonna go through um, and basically run this process um, of training the model on the data set. Um, and then register will go and register the model with the um, Azure ML. So I can go into my Kubeflow. So this is my pipelines, uh, pipeline, and this is not super complicated. Like again, this could be more complicated in terms of what it actually runs. 
but this particular one goes through three stages that we talked about. So again, this is a container that it picks up from the Azure Container Registry and it does pre-processing. Um, in this case, it says, okay, I already have the data, so I can skip that step. Then it goes through the training, so it basically picks up um, the images um, with the labels, right? And then it goes through five epochs. This is configurable, so I can kick it off with different hyperparameters. Um, and then it goes into register, so it goes and registers the model. And again, um, I could try to serve it in other ways, but I am serving this from Azure ML, so I'm going and registering the model with Azure ML Workspace. Now, you can see that I have a bunch of different models in here. Um, and the model actually comes with metadata, so I can see both what I use to train the model, um, and I can also see a whole bunch of like different things about the model and the model version and stuff like that. So I could actually, there's a handy button here which I could use to redeploy this. So if I wanted to go back to a model um, that is a different version, I could do that. Now, the benefits of this is I have a repository for my models and this, both this and Kubeflow supports all types of different model files. So it allows you to, instead of worrying about how to convert your model into an API endpoint, you could just use the service, register the model with it, and basically use that as a service. Okay, and then once that's complete and I have run my pipeline, so basically what happened, I know that I've confused everybody sufficiently. So basically what happened was I checked in some code, it ran a, a CI pipeline which registered a bunch of containers, then it kicked off a Kubeflow pipeline that took up the containers and ran this through the steps of the Kubeflow, okay? And then once the Kubeflow was done, it registered the model with Azure ML. Now this is where this one picks up. So this is another Azure DevOps pipeline. Okay, so it starts with two artifacts and one of them is a one I'm using to trigger. So it's the AML model that was registered with the ML workspace. Um, and the other is a GitHub Kubeflow. Um, so it looks directly at the repository and picks up some metadata files. Um, then it runs, it profiles the model, so the step for profiling basically define, identifies which CPU and memory I actually want to have to run the model in production, so tries to identify how much power I need. Um, I could also just take a bet and skip that step. Then this particular one is deploying the model um, into an ACI, so Azure Container Instances. Um, so basically, this took a, the model that I had, it's great that nobody can see anything. So it took a model that I had and deployed it into Azure Container Instances, and that is part of Azure ML. Again, I could do this without the first party service if I tried really hard. Then I'm going into testing the model, so I go and throw a couple of things. So let's actually go into code here because it uses script. So this script actually throws a couple of files on it. Um, so this is a tacos and burritos model for no other reason that this was a sample model that was easy to access. Um, basically, I throw a taco and a burrito at it and it tries to identify. Um, if it's a taco or a burrito, so we can go into logs for this thing. Can't see me. Okay, so basically this threw a couple of images at it and it said, okay, this is a burrito image and I'm about really unsure that it is. Um, and it took me, I don't know, less than a second to identify that. Right, so once I tested my model, I also have another step that deploys it into an AKS cluster, quote unquote production, um, and I have a gated check um, that is asking me if I actually wanna go and do that. Um, 
So, which would work if this actually kicked off the thing. So, questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, so I have a data set that I'm downloading. It, again, it's a clean data set. Um, Google now has a, a ton of sample data sets for different things, but you might need your own data, data sets for certain problems. Basically, you need a human who will sit down and identify which images are tacos and which are burritos or whatever it is you're training your model on um, and label that data. And then you need something to tell the training model, um, training algorithm, which, which one is which, right? So once it goes through the training process, it will start be, being able to identify if it's a taco or a burrito or whatever, it is, cats, dogs, stuff. Yeah. Do I have the data scientists working in Kubeflow? So in, in theory, yes, you would. So basically, like I said, you don't want to have the data scientists deploy Kubeflow because it's essentially just deploying a Kubernetes cluster and configuring a bunch of stuff. Um, but in terms of building the actual workflow, yeah, you want the data scientists to build the workflow. And like I said, in Azure ML, you could also build similar workflows. Also, if you are talking about these things, some um, you sometimes have sample workflows out there, especially for Kubeflow, which is an open source product uh, project. So there's a lot of sample workflows out there. But how you actually, so in terms of the complicated stuff, this one's pretty simple and straightforward, right? But in terms of complicated stuff, um, this is magic to me. So I, you know, someone needs to figure out which pieces need to happen in the ML workflow in particular. Yeah. Yeah, so th this one's a TensorFlow model, um, and it's being registered with Azure ML. So, we can see it out here. But it basically, there's different types of models. You, so could you, because you could use like TensorFlow or PyTorch or Scikit and all these different things. And some of them generate different file types. So in, in terms of both of these tools, they're familiar with the common file types and they will be able to kind of process that and identify what to do with it. But if you were gonna do it yourself, there's also open source tools that you could convert um, a model file into something that could answer an HTTP call. Yeah. Okay, if I wasn't using Azure ML, what would I use as a model repository? So you could, in theory, use something like Artifactory or something like that, and just, you know, something that can keep files regardless of their extension, right? Um, the, the problem is you have to be able to version it, and you have to be able to attach some of the metadata files for that to be valid. So, again, you could absolutely implement storage that will solve this problem, but more work for you. Yeah, so what's the interaction between Azure DevOps and uh, Kubeflow? So Kubeflow is actually not a Google product, it's, it's a open source product, but it does come, you know, it did start with Google. Um, so we do, Azure ML behind the scenes actually does run on Kubernetes, and it is a sort of similar thing, but it isn't exactly like Kubeflow. Um, like I said, I could, so for this pipeline, if we're talking about the model training, so I'm doing this in here. I could also do the, the workflow in Azure ML. Um, and right now, what I'm doing with CI CD pipelines is basically just triggering all the steps, right? So all that Azure DevOps says, it calls a command, which I can show you, that is triggering Kubeflow, right, to start this pipeline with certain parameters. And then it actually consumes Again, it consumes the model from AML, but this is basically wiring it all together. So, oh, one second. Um, basically, if you did Jenkins and you ran the same 
command that would work just the same, right? So all these tools are kind of like you could mix and match between them. Yeah. Right, so it does not, and basically, Azure ML is working on something that would allow you to actually identify model drift automatically, but right now, what I would have to do is basically have some type of environment in which I test how accurate my model is, which means for me to identify drift, I would have to get new data with new labels and be able to constantly feed it back into it, um, and then have to, uh, and again, accuracy, this is another thing that gets kind of complicated. Accuracy is not always a single number, right? Sometimes you have multiple things that you need to look at, which is why I'm saying parts of it probably need to be looked at by a human before you deploy anything. Um, but this, th this whole thing, like if you, if you go into this and you deploy this, um, it took us, what, a couple minutes, right, to get it actually didn't work, so you don't have to believe me that it takes a couple of minutes. But anyway, let's say it takes about 20 minutes because model training actually takes a, a while to do. Um, compare that to you trying to do this all manually, it would be very, very painful. Um, and again, the other thing that is kind of hard for demos is that some of these models actually do train a couple hours to train, uh, take a couple hours to train, so it's hard to demo something that takes that long. Uh, I wanted to do one with a um, code search, because GitHub recently, in collaboration with Microsoft, released a code search, and now it like natural language code search, which is really cool, and they have the models and stuff, but it takes a ton of compute and it runs like hours. So, um, not a good demo. Yes? I can check, this one is not really big, but in some cases it's, it is really big because like, if you want to have a certain level of accuracy, you definitely want to um, have enough label data. Yeah? Yeah, so do any products offer version control for data sets? So Azure ML actually does. Kubeflow, I don't believe it does. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if anybody knows. But in terms of Kubeflow, I'm just downloading the data set to the attached volume. So if I had a new data set, I would have to have a process around versioning it. Azure ML is actually about either release or about to release a feature that allows you to pin the data set to a version. Okay, so I just have a couple more slides maybe, so punchline. Any CI CD pipeline is better than no pipeline. I seriously believe that um, even if, you know, you have some bits and pieces that are still not worked out. And like I said, this one, for instance, doesn't have the model retraining, but you can see how you could add that if you just continue to automate. Um, and iterate over this. Um, and it definitely, definitely simplifies your life compared to just doing one-offs for every single time you deploy this. And uh, DevOps, because change is the only constant in life. I do want to finish on a little bit of a different note. So a lot of people out there are training um, you know, models and not necessarily sort of understanding the impacts of this. One of the things that I learned while I was kind of getting into this ML stuff um, is bias is not property of humans, it's a property of information. So whenever I try to create heuristics, right, and generalize information, say, okay, the rule is if I see X, it means Y, bias is created, right, because I'm taking a shortcut, aggregating data, and then I have to create the most logical response. So a lot of the stuff that's being released right now is already creating for humans, because this stuff runs in places you wouldn't expect. This stuff runs for police in terms of identifying which neighborhoods are likely to, to you know, have crimes. Um, this runs for judges, for being able to identify 
you know, a, if a person is likely to commit another crime or not before they, you know, produce a verdict. Um, this runs for uh, one of the examples of bias. There was um, an ad that someone run, ran on Facebook, and it was for CEO level positions, and it uh, just basically identified um, only men as appropriate per people to display the ad to because most of the data in the label data set was that men held their CEO positions. So we're kind of perpetuating that bias, right? And that also, so the algorithms for the police that I mentioned, there was a couple big scandals when those were racially biased and they were identifying um, people of color or certain zip codes as being more likely to be crime infested and stuff like that. This stuff may be deciding on your next mortgage or stuff like that, or your credit score, or, or things like that. Um, so whenever your company is building an ML model, just make sure to catch up on how this cat could be harmful to humans and how this could be you know, biased against certain um, populations. So build AI responsibly, and thank you.